Welcome back to our continuing discussion on the Invisible College with John Barnwell and Douglas Gabriel. Welcome, John. I noticed that uh, you had uh, sent me notification that you had read a lot of uh, the feedback in the remarks underneath the last video on the Invisible College, and that's prompting us to do another one because there was so many, uh, so much feedback, so many good questions. And so I think that's what we should do today is elaborate further on that. One that I thought was very interesting was a dear friend of ours um, who wrote and said all of his life he's had a recurring dream that he'd go to a school and he was on the school grounds out in front, but very seldom did he get to enter. But every once in a while he, he would get to enter and there'd be teachers there and they'd teach him in one of these two or three classrooms. And then he said, and then only a few times in his life he found his way to the elevator and he went up to the second and then to the third floor, but he didn't get off. That is exactly what we're talking about. That is what the Invisible College is all about. It's where you go at night when you sleep, and if you're awake, and even as his dream indicates over a long period of time, you might wake up and realize that you're with these great teachers who are teaching you, and that you're in a college, you're in a school, you're in all these other things that we called it last time, you know, Shambhala, the... Uh, the the uh, White Island, the Gold Island, the uh, Golden Halls, the Halls of Memory, the Halls of Learning. So many different references in every single culture to this idea of the Invisible College. Today, I think we should take an, a, a few steps further. So, what was your feedback from last time, John? Well, it was it was actually quite similar. I had people commenting how they had been receiving content that's meaningful for their spiritual path throughout their life within the realm of dream. And I think that that's a, a real key point that we all are our own process of development. And uh, Rudolf Steiner had given very specific indications uh, regarding these types of themes throughout his work. One of which is he says, and this is a comment on uh, what we might call a dream story, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is one of the central uh, testaments of the Rosicrucians. And it takes place, it's like uh, a sort of dream sequence that is, is written down by Johann Valentin Andreas. Uh, in commenting on this, Rudolf Steiner has said, and I quote, the spirit being is an objective reality. The picture by which this being is revealed is a modification brought about by it through the raying out of the formative force body, or the etheric body. This imagination must not be confused with a vision. The subjective experience of one having such an imagination is something completely different from that of the visionary. The visionary lives in his vision through an inner compulsion. The one that is experiencing imagination unites this to the spirit being referred to or to a spiritual event with the same conscious inner freedom with which a word or a sentence is used to express the object of the senses. Anyone without knowledge of the nature of the spiritual world might suppose that it is completely unnecessary to clothe the pictureless experiences of the spiritual world and imaginations that evoke the semblance of the visionary. To this it must be objected that in reality, it is not the imagination that is the essential thing in what is spiritually perceived, but rather that this is the means through which what is essential must reveal itself within the soul. A sense color cannot be perceived without the definite activity of an eye, just as one cannot experience something spiritual without meeting it from within by a definite imagination. But this does not hinder the use of pure concepts, such as are customary in natural science or philosophy, for representing spiritual experiences obtained through imagination. This present article uses such concepts in describing the content of the chemical wedding. However, in the 17th century, when Johann Valentin Andreas 
wrote the book, it was not yet customary to use such concepts to any great extent. Instead, the direct imagination through which the supersensible beings and events had been experienced was represented. So there you have a very objective, almost scientific presentation of how one can meet uh, the types of events that one encounters within the world of the dream. And in essence, what he is saying is that you are having encounters with spiritual beings, but the content that you're receiving from that is dependent on your own inner nature. And so you bring out of your own soul uh, images that your mind can use to frame what you're receiving as content from the spiritual world. And that's like your friend, he's has the school and the elevator and all these things. Were he to be absolutely awakened, he would not be seeing schools and elevators. He would be presented with a spiritual being before him who is bringing to him content of the spiritual world, most likely his guardian angel. Absolutely. That's such a beautiful passage you chose because it points at what we talked about in the previous conversation, that as we work on these images, these dreams, the astral body, perhaps we can see through to the etheric, and then out of that etheric comes nourishment. So Rudolf Steiner speaks of imagination as a higher form of thinking that has to be warmed up in the heart, and that it tends towards the spiritual and the archetypal, which is more or less what we would say is eternal. Imaginations are not uh, flitting around fantasies. They are not just pictures. They are pictures that are connected to real life, to the archetypal forces, to the etheric forces that are described there. And as you say, whatever our religion is, is what we will see those images as, or through the filter of uh, our higher order thinking. So each person may see something quite different, but when we go into that world of dream, what is really shocking to people, and it just amazes me no matter how many times I share this with people, but most people don't believe they're going to die. And they don't think about death whatsoever. And all they know is mm, it's a flip of a coin whether or not they're going to have life after death. But the simplest of all the spiritual principles, which if understood to begin with, makes all the rest quite easy, is that where you go when you sleep is the same place you go when you die. And as you pointed out in the seven mysteries, that we are in the period when we're supposed to work on birth and death. So the question really needs to be asked, not only will there be life after death, the other question that needs to be asked is, is there life before birth? Because if there is, then you are eternal, you are immortal, you are a spirit, you are not just a physical being. And this is what we were pointing at in the some of the references and innuendos of all the different orders of groups, brotherhoods, they used to be called, um, because oftentimes women weren't allowed into these mysteries, especially in modern day with masonry or other uh, forms of old mystery wisdom that kind of went underground and became the property of oftentimes brotherhoods. And so these brotherhoods, if you're a mason, which I know you are and I am, the whole point of masonry is to be raised from the dead so that you realize you're immortal. The point of Christianity is that Christ showed, Jesus Christ showed that he went beyond death. So if a human being could understand that when they're looking at these images, as you've so pointed out with Christian Rosenkreutz's chemical wedding, those images are had to do intimately with you and what happens when you cross the threshold between this physical world and the spiritual world. That's the same threshold that you cross when you come into birth, and it's the same threshold that you cross when you die. But the good news is you can cr consciously cross that threshold. And once you can consciously cross that threshold, then you have absolute certainty that you are 
a spiritual being and probably immortal, but certainly there's life after death. So this is the content of the great myths, of the, of the imaginations that came out of the myths that taught cultures in the past. These are the same imaginations that teach religion and teach morality so that when you get ready to cross that threshold that you have something to bring to the spiritual world in terms of moral deeds and love and all the things that whatever religion, whether you're a Jainist or a Buddhist or a Hindu or um, a Christian, whatever religion you are, it doesn't really matter. You're going to have those archetypes that you relate to. But once you get across that threshold, the question is, do you have something to share with them? Because if you do, did those spiritual beings give you something back? Kind of like what we call the uh, nectar and ambrosia of the gods, or the heavenly dew, or you wake up with an inspiration, or you wake up with an intuition, or you wake up with an imagination, or you are given some kind of moral content for your life that fires you into doing something good for life, that's when you've had a true communication on the other side of the threshold, in that realm where we dream sometimes, where we sleep, I should say, and where we sometimes dream, and where we die, and where we're still alive after death. We're still going through those seven realms that we talked about, the seven mysteries as you described it last time, the seven human organs, the seven chambers of the heart, seven chambers of the brain. It's all like the elevator. That's just an image. You get on the elevator, you go up. It really isn't up. It's more like out in all directions once you cross the threshold. So it's a beautiful thing that you brought in terms of the chemical wedding with Christian Rosenkreutz. I'm sure you can say much more about that, but I think you were also going to give us uh, some more illumination on the, the concept of the seven mysteries, which uh, I think so many people reacted to last time. Yes. Well, it's important to understand that these ideas uh, regarding the seven mysteries, and if I could, I'll, I'll give a summation of them again, just so that it makes it easier for people to live into the concepts, because these seed concepts give you uh, tools uh, for interpreting, and when you're approaching esoteric teachings in the inner school, it's always considered there are at least seven levels of interpretation of the content that one receives from the spiritual world. So that the first one would be the mystery of the abyss, the one, the point. The second mystery would be the mystery of number, and that's the line that proceeds between two points. And then you have the mystery of affinity, sympathy, antipathy, like, and dislike, the realm of the astral. That's symbolized by a triangle. And then you have the fourth mystery, the mystery of birth and death, which is represented by a cross, sometimes by a cube. And then the fifth mystery, the mystery of evil, is the pentagram or the five-pointed star, which can be inverted to be pointed down or pointing upward. And then the sixth mystery is the mystery of the word. And that's symboled is the six-pointed star. And then the seventh mystery is the mystery of godliness. And that is the six-pointed star with a dot in the center, or it can be a seven-pointed star. Now, in looking into these mysteries, you can see in them is contained in seed form very, very fundamental concepts. For example, the first mystery, you could think of that as trance consciousness, and that would relate to the mineral kingdom. The second mystery, the mystery of number, is wonderfully revealed in the geometry of the plant world, where the plant world consciousness is dwelling in a deep dream sleep. The third mystery, the mystery of affinity, like and dislike, that's represented with the animal kingdom. And animals are continually following 
these instinctual motions away and toward various things that are they're guided to through their uh, feelings and their their inner nature that's preconceptual and then of course the fourth mystery the human mystery that is the mystery of the i or the i am that's at the core of our being that which is capable of manifesting what is truly human in man so that we can make judgments and it makes us more than the animals or the plants or the minerals although we are custodians over them my question to you would be are the first three mysteries the past the fourth mystery is the present and the next three mysteries of the future absolutely in the most fundamental sense uh, of course you can take these this sevenfold mystery and use it to interpret any part of the cyclical activity of history but yes you could say that that mankind and their development first began as beings of warmth that were donated from the spiritual world and then was added the principle of life or the etheric and then was added the astral sympathy antipathy realm kind of a ghost-like existence except before birth ghost-like until finally we're able to bring all these principles together and and bring the crowning achievement of humankind which is to have an eye and to be able to integrate all of these principles together in the human condition well it makes me think that we have these concurrent bodies physical etheric astral and ego they're all happening at one time but what you're describing those donations of those hierarchies happened in the past so in a way there's a multi-dimensional multi time perspective going on here and as I think about the mysteries of birth and death the ones we're supposed to be working on now birth I think human beings are not appreciative they're not they have no gratitude for the donations of the hierarchies that gave them their physical etheric and astral body and in a way it's that question of the pre-birth state where did we come from so it needs a cosmology what is the human ego so the human ego stands there in this time between birth and death and needs to ask the question, where did we come from? And where are we going? And what do I do about the fact that death is an imminent reality that I need to work with? And what about these other mysteries, especially the closest mystery of the future, which is evil? So death and evil have all been linked together, and I think that there are brotherhoods or there are groups of people who have gotten stuck and they are afraid of death and they do not appreciate where they came from so they're stuck in the present and the mysteries of the past especially the mythological uh, religious spiritual images of the past help us know where we came from where we are and where we're going and that's a cosmology and it's so missing in our time so that oftentimes if you do not have a cosmology it is very difficult to understand and be appreciative of the very gifts of our physical body our etheric body our astral body our ego let alone the future bodies that Rudolf Steiner describes and we described last time under many different names but those three realms let's just call them imagination inspiration and intuition these capacities of the future that can only really be reached into when we can cross that threshold of death or we can cross into the dream world with such a clear conscience that we can participate with these beings and give them the gifts of our good works, our good thoughts, our good feelings, our good deeds, and then get back from them possible imaginations, inspirations, intuitions, that really those are the important things of life. One single moment of inspiration can fire somebody's soul for the rest of their life. There are many people, John, I'm sure you know them, who have never had a dream in their life that they remember. And that there are other people who dream in technicolor and they understand that they can go anywhere in their dream because whatever you think, whatever you desire, 
just appears before you in your dream. It's the opposite of this world. We, don't, we chase after things here. They come to us when we're in the dream world or in the spiritual world. And so people don't have these experiences. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going, and they're, they're terrified to even ask the question, what is death and is there life after death? I have spoken with groups of people where I literally said to them, first thing, you're all going to die. And the looks on their faces were so horrible. And they told me, that, don't, don't say that. Don't tell me I'm going to die. Because by the time I get to death, science is going to have a pill I can take that I guess they assume they're going to live forever or that, you know, I, I don't understand why people can't perceive that the Tibetans or, or understand that the Tibetans tell you 10 times a day, you should say to yourself, I'm going to die. This life is impermanent. What am I doing that is permanent? What am I doing that is eternal? And as you pointed out, and I think in the, in the passage you read, we can't take the sense perceptions of the physical world into the spiritual world. We can't take them into dreams. When you look at things in dreams, they're not the same as they are in the physical world. They're quite different. Matter of fact, dreams are oftentimes, according to insight from spiritual teachers, they're kind of opposite or upside down or backwards or inside out. And so we don't know how to control them. They, they, that's because so, dreams are quite different. We could get into many uh, details about dreams and the way Rudolf Steiner tells you to prepare yourself before you go to sleep. And maybe you would want to go over the Rukshaw, John, the, this exercise of Steiner's, but I don't want to get too much into detail, but the point is, is that these realms of dreams are also the same realms that you live in, the physical, etheric, astral, and ego bodies that we are uh, have surrounding us in this particular physical realm. But there's ways to work with your dreams. There's ways to enhance your capacities to remember your dreams. There's ways to prepare yourself. We've seen that in many different spiritual paths. They speak of, you know, the transcendence that can happen to go across the threshold and meet the spiritual world, even when you're awake, or to receive these imaginations, which Steiner points out are far beyond just a vision or a fantasy. Uh, they are reality. They are going to come to pass. They are the future coming to us in the moment when we can be receptive enough for them. But in the dream world, it's kind of hard to control the dreams. So Steiner gives some exercises on how we can do that. But I like to think, when I think of birth and death, I like to think birth should lead us to gratitude. And death should lead us to the courage to be able to cross that threshold and figure out the way to speak the language of the Spirit so that when I'm in that realm, or when anyone is in that realm, that I have something to contribute, that I'm part of the conversation, and that when I come back, I have something to bring into this realm that is from the spiritual realm. Yes. Well, bringing wakefulness into the world of dreams and bringing awareness of the world of dreams in one's waking state, it brings to mind, I, I used to attend... Uh, church services at the Christian community. And it was uh, an interesting experience because it happened every time I would go. There would be a busload of, of handicapped children, mentally handicapped children of, of all various types. And they would come to the service too. And all during the service, they'd be fidgeting and looking all around and constant movement until the culmination of the surface service happened with the consecration of the host the eucharist but at that point they would all become still and look at the host every single one of them and it happened every time and it was as if for that brief moment they were allowed to have an experience of of what it means to be focused within the eye and so it's this I consciousness that is our greatest gift. And if we can bring a greater awareness of this I through being able to perceive our own thinking and see that thinking is much, much more than just an echo of the physical world, but that we can dwell within our thoughts in, in such a way that it can bring us to uh, a sense of, 
a separation from our sense life so that we're more open to the content of the spiritual world. That's a very beautiful image. And yes, I've uh, had that same experience that you've had watching that. And it is quite profound, that sacredness for the eye. I mentioned that Rudolf Steiner gives an exercise called, in German, the Ruckschau, which basically means that you're going to look at your day backwards. So right before you go to sleep, and you do your meditations, prayers, whatever, but right before you go to sleep, you try to image everything that happened to you in the day in a reverse order. But also, not your experience, but the experience of those who were around you. How did they experience you? So when you, you remember what you said, but now you need to look deeper to see how you might have affected those around you. And as you do this, and you learn to go backwards in time and re-look at space in a different way, not from your perspective, but from the perspective of everyone around you, this opens up your capacity to have more connection when you are in the dream world. Now, this is not just some idea, some spiritual idea, or some fantasy of Rudolf Steiner's. Science has now proven that when you go to sleep, the first thing that happens is you have rapid eye movement, which, in fact, they have followed the eye movement, and they've watched people and um, studied what they saw during the day, and then they saw that the eyes replicate, going in a reverse order, everything that you saw that day. So it's kind of like unwinding a, a recording, because that's how you're going to be able to sleep. You first need to let your eyes somewhat digest what it is that you experienced in the day. But Rudolf Steiner would also say it's also more than just vision. It's also your feelings and your hearing and your will and all, all aspects of you. But as you do this process of going backwards, it prepares you for what you also experience across the threshold. So imagine when you go across the threshold, things are somewhat in reverse at first. And then they're the opposite in terms of what you experience in space. Instead of you looking out, it's the whole world is looking in at you. And it's bringing you information about who you are and about how loving you are or how grumpy you are or whatever it is that you were doing comes back to you. What is that? That's a view of karma. And so now you start to see that karma itself is a surrounding process somewhat like dreams that comes to you and brings to you again and again and again what it is that you need, what it is that you experienced, what it is that you gave to others. It's your learning. It's the invisible college. It's the school. You are being schooled every night when you go to sleep. But now, that's just the first stage. There are other stages we could get into in great detail. But what happens is, we expand in all directions once we cross the threshold. We go into those realms. And then depending upon which realm it is, that will create the environment that you're there experiencing and whether you have something to give that particular environment. And then you keep expanding outward until you reach what could be called the sun at midnight or the rings of Saturn. If you're a high initiate, you are conscious through all seven realms. Most of us are pretty much caught up in the first, second, third realms, which actually have very specific natures to them and can be have been described by Rudolf Steiner. But as we expand all the way out to Saturn, because that's really the local limit of the body of what human beings experience in the solar system, we then stand there and we look at the stars for a moment, and then we have a relationship with the beings beyond our solar system, if we are that highly evolved. Then we turn around and we come back through those same realms. And as we do, whatever it is that we gave to that realm, however much we gave in our moral development, in our moral gifts, that's what that realm gives back to you. That's where imagination, inspiration, intuition come from. So as you come back into your body and you come through those realms, you bring back what it is pretty much a spiritual version of what you as a human gave to the spiritual world, the spiritual world now gives to you as a human, and you then become the embodiment of the spiritual world. Now, if you have that experience consciously as an initiate, you can never question whether there is life after death. 
That is silly. As a matter of fact, Rudolf Steiner once said, and it took me many years to be able to handle this concept, and that concept is a healthy human thinking person will arrive simply through logic at the fact that reincarnation is a reality. Repeated human incarnations is a reality. Simply thinking it through will bring you to that. And so one can actually say that we have the capacities to understand what's on the other side of the threshold. We have the capacities to understand what the invisible college, the realm of Shambhala, the realm of the etheric, is trying to teach us in that school that we go to every night, or we could go to every day if we sit down and meditate on it and cross the threshold consciously. But if we can do that, then we are in a reciprocal relationship where we feed the spiritual world and the spiritual world feeds us. And I think that that's really the way to start to face evil, is to understand that once you get and have a cosmology that gives you a perspective of where you came from before birth, the birth mysteries, and a perspective of where you're going after death, the death mysteries, which are what our time is. We stand between this birth and death mysteries. When that happens and you become one of these beings who is certain that you are immortal and you have 100% concrete proof because you're in communication with the spiritual world, then you can start to face evil, perhaps, and go into these even higher realms where inspiration and intuition reside. And intuition is much more than just um, ha having foreknowledge of something. Intuition is uh, the most profound experience that a human being can actually have uh, in this plane at this time. So when we say the words imagination, inspiration, intuition, they are nothing like what we would uh, perhaps conceive of in this realm. For instance, take that one moment of inspiration how long does it take for a moment of inspiration to happen? Less than a second, a millisecond. But it can inspire you for the next 70 years. So imagine the quality, the qualitative nature of whatever it was that alighted in you in the moment of inspiration that could then fire your soul for so long. What is that? That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about, oh, I have a nice image in my mind of a dream that I had. No, you would have to work all the way through to the real content of that dream. And that's why dreams need someone to help you interpret them at first, because they're usually quite obvious to someone who understands dreams, and they're not obvious at all to the person who has the dream. Matter of fact, the person that we're talking about, uh, I'll say his name because he's such a good friend and he'll be listening to this. So what David, when he told us the story of going to the school, he didn't understand that. And then all of a sudden he got it, you know. So at the moment that he got it and he understood what all these dreams, the recurring dreams all of his entire life have been teaching him, time and space was defied in that moment and everything that he ever experienced in those dreams became clear to him. Well, that is like an intuition. So an intuition, again, just like an inspiration, can fire you to do spiritual deeds that could last not just through you, but if you write it down or share it with people, it could change cultures. It could change history. One person's intuition, one person's inspiration, even one person's imagination could change history for all people. And so... Those moments can't be explained. Those are spiritual moments, and those go beyond time, space, and even sometimes beyond consciousness. And those are the moments that we're talking about, and those are the moments that I know that when I go into the Invisible College, I become like a, uh, as some Masonic orders say, in the first stage, you're a sister, because you're, you're female, you're receptive, you're listening, you're ready to become pregnant with the gifts of the spiritual world, you're ready to hold them as Mary held Jesus in her womb or any other great spiritual being. We are that being like Mary if we purify our soul to the point that the spirit is all that we're interested in, that which is eternal, that which is beyond the, before birth and beyond death, that's what we're going for, then we become a sister, we become a bride. Rudolf Steiner calls it, we become the Virgin Sophia. There's many, many names for this stage of spiritual development, but what it is is it's an opening in your soul 
so that you can start to receive these things because we can talk about it all day long. But when it happens, it enters you. It isn't about just talking about it. It's about em embodying it. You can uh, even behold it and you still haven't embodied it. So you can see these things with new spiritual organs. But when the time comes for you to really be pregnant with the spirit, then in a way, all of the old, oftentimes male-dominated brotherhoods dissolve. Those were organizations that didn't let women in. Everyone gets to get into the invisible college. Everyone gets to be pregnant with the Spirit. Everyone gets to be the Virgin Sophia as you cross into the invisible college in the first stage. Or there's three stages of masonry. We can describe them in many, many, many systems, but they all came, come down to about the same thing. You are in a stage of receptivity, of purification, of renunciation in that first stage when imagination can start to fill you. And, as we pointed out before, literally hierarchical beings start to communicate with you, as you said, probably your guardian angel. Yes, when your guardian angel appears, most people think it's God. Because, compared to the physical world, an angel looks like God, and is, of course, connected to God. So you follow an angel, and you lead to the archangel, and you follow an archangel, and they lead to the time spirit, on up through the nine hierarchies, directly to the presence of of the divine. And that's what really can happen when you sleep at night. It's, it's that simple. And it's shocking to realize that people don't think about these things. They never think about them. They may never think about them until someone mentions it and then they say, oh my gosh, that's so obvious. And then they have an intuition, an intuition they might have prepared 35 years for, 45 years for. And then they have that one moment, that intuition. And that could be the foundation of their spiritual development for the rest of their life. So I wanted to give a picture of Steiner's Ruckschau and what you can do. There are spiritual exercises you can do to make you more awake and aware in these realms and prepared to understand these mysteries that um, are John has described in the seven mysteries. And if I could, in closing, I'd like to share uh, my translation from the French of an alchemical poem by the Comte de Saint-Germain. Curious scrutator of the whole of nature, I have known the great all, its principle and its end. I have seen gold and its power deep within the mind. I have seized its material and surprised its leaven. I explain by what art the soul within the mother's womb makes its home, carries it out, and as a grape seed placed against a grain of wheat under the humid earth. The one plant, the other vine, are the bread and wine. Nothing was, God willed, and nothing became something. In my doubting, I sought out that on which the universe is poised. Nothing appeared to sustain the equilibrium or to serve as a support Finally, with the weights of praise and of blame, I weighed the eternal, it called my soul, I died, I adored, I knew nothing more.